I'm Al Phil Reese. I'm Anna Safford. And this is Mod Po Minute, actually five minutes. We're hoping to scratch the surface of a short poem that we like. So let's get started. Well, I'm here with Aaron Moray. Hi, Aaron. Hi there, Al. We have a book called Song of Songs and co-created by Claire Huo and Robert Maisels. It's called Song of Songs. And it's created in a really interesting way. I'm sure Aaron will have something to say about it. And what we're going to do is focus on one of the 85s. And it's called Veiled Turrets, Scarlet Thread. I'm going to ask Aaron to read it, which is not the easiest thing to do. I'm going to hold it up here like this. Not the easiest things to do, and then we'll talk about it. David, his veiled turrets, a thousand shields, a scarlet thread, a pomegranate, split open behind the veil. Where are the words coming from for this? Where are, where are they f mining or finding the words? The words, I think, come from, in, in this particular volume, because there's about five or six volumes, come from uh, Song of Songs, mm -hmm. from the, what, uh, what they say here, arguably the most poetic and erotically charged book of the Torah. And um, he's bringing together, like, um, Hebrew and uh, also ch Chinese ways of writing texts using just characters. The characters in both Chinese and in, um, in well, Biblical Hebrew anyways, didn't have punctuation, didn't have spaces between the letters. You had to figure out how you were going to read it as you were reading it. And so this poem is read the Western way, which is not the way the Torah is read or Chinese. It's read from left to right and down the page. But you're faced with this poem wherein you have to make the words because you know how to make English words. The poem isn't even going to make the words for you readily. And what is the significance of 85? Um, 85 is, is, as I've learned from reading this, the minimum number of, uh, in the, the Torah, or in the Talmudic arguments, it's the minimum number of letters that uh, go into making a book. And a book with 85 characters is, is the perfect book. And why is it perfect? I mean, you think well, you of making have to a ask book. Ask those with, guys. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you think of making a book as more than eighty-five characters. There's some, so it's a numerological thing. So. It's some kind of numerological thing, and it, yeah. it started out with an argument about what what actions that it would be permitted to do on the Sabbath, which not many, right? And the would it be possible to save a book from a burning building? That's so cool. Can you say that again and explain? What does this have to do with saving a book? If you save a book... On Sabbath, could, could you on, go out? What would right. it be possible to sit to do on the Sabbath? Could you right. save things from a burning building? No. Right. But could you save a book? And then in this exegesis, there's something like you could save a book, but only if it's a perfect book. So only if it has 85 characters. That's so brilliant. And so uh, Robert and Claire are turning various elements of ancient culture, in this case the, the Song of Songs, into books that can be saved from the conflagration of our current world. Wow. Aaron, there are two reasons I think you picked this to talk about. One is you're interested in what happens when we disrupt either, <laughs> either yeah. a little bit or a lot conventional reading practices, and the second, you're interested in translational matters. Mm -hmm. Can you talk about both or either of those? Well, I think disrupt, I, I, I like uh, the idea of writing itself as an act of reading and writing itself as a kind of, and reading is always to me a disruptive practice, I guess. And I like that I can look at this and it's almost like an eye test, you know. Mm -hmm. It's like your mind wants to make words, but in an eye test they, they don't actually make words. But here I start, you start to see letter combinations that are, actually exist in English, so I, I know that there's something there, like there's a, an uret, so there might be, oh, there is a T, there's a turret, but why, oh, is there turrets? So that I, you start to, 
you start to see how words begin to co cohere from signs. And um, Maisel's and Huo are taking um, works from an entirely different alphabets, mm. and, uh, which means entirely different relationships between sound and sense, and trying to transpose the experience of trying to read, you know, those alphabets, trying to read Hebrew when you're not used to it, trying to read Chinese when you're just learning, and we're, so he confronts us with English, and we have to look at it as if we're just learning what letters are all about. So it defamiliarizes English, just when we all thought we could just get that right and do it unconsciously, we have to almost learn our own language again. Yeah. Can you say something generally about, about why translational issues fascinate you so much, and why you, I assume, think it's very important for all of us to grapple with these issues and stop just writing in our own language because we're too comfortable and so forth. Well, to just realize that there's more languages exist and probably other discussions about poetics are happening in them and it's good to create bridges and bring those into our, our culture and also give what we have to other cultures too. Yeah. I think because we're always only, I mean, I see, you know, as I've said before, poetry itself as a kind of conversation. It's almost like a a blanket and we're all weaving our corner of it or weaving our little bit of it and occasionally we tug on it and or somebody on the other side tugs and we feel it mm. we feel our poetic world move because somebody's mm. tugging over there and I think yeah. uh, translation helps to add to that conversation and to the richness of that yeah. of that weave plus it makes me realize that nothing we do or say in English is actually natural it's yes. all already artifice it's already uh, yeah. constructed yeah Aaron thank you so much you're welcome <laughs> If you liked this episode, watch another and subscribe. And join us for ModPo, a free and open course at modpo.org.